horizontal gene transfer. First, I should say a word about vertical gene transfer. That's what most people think of this, the ordinary kind. If you'll go back far enough uh, into history, you will find that uh, um, geology as it was arising in uh, uh, Christianized Western Europe, uh, well, Europe in general, um, started out with the idea of the flood. Then as people looked around, they saw massive uh, uh, different layers. And they thought, well, this must be different floods. And so they had multiple floods. And as time went on, it seemed like uh, Noah's flood would be the last one. And uh, they started putting time between these multiple floods. Well, as they started doing that, their people started looking at the different organisms that were in the different uh, layers. And some people would interpret that as, well, God made this group of creatures, and then uh, they got uh, wiped out, and then we have a new group of creatures that came along. Uh, and uh, some people were uncomfortable with that kind of a God who would create multiple times and then destroy his handiwork. And uh, partly as a as a, a way to avoid that, and partly as a way to avoid the flood itself, Lyell proposed that there was no flood, that all these things took place over long, long periods of time with very little change in between. And now, that's been partially reversed. We now know that there was a large flood that covered a good share of the state of Washington and parts of Oregon and in Idaho and uh, Montana, and uh, that flood has now become standard theory, and we've discovered that there are more floods in places like Siberia that did the same kind of thing, and there are even people who have said that there are, again, large catastrophes that have created many of these layers. Uh, Derek Ager comes to mind. but. That hasn't filtered into the textbooks very much. And so the biologists who learn still learn kind of a Lyellian geology. There are different animals in the different layers, and what do you do with them? Well, um, there was some pr proposal, there are some proposals that there was descent with modification, and I want to point out that Darwin wasn't the first to uh, suggest that. Spencer and Lamarck preceded him. The, um, the part that Darwin played was that he proposed a mechanism for the change between one uh, species and another. And uh, once you could get beyond species, the thought was you could get, um, if you can get a little bit of change, you can get as much change as you wanted, including everything from one original tree. Well, that's. Uh, one or a few organisms, it would be nice if it was just one. And each organism has one or two parents, depending on uh, the organism. Some of them reproduce asexually, so they only have one. And the heredity uh, was found to come from the parents, first uh, via the theories of Mendel, and then later with Crick and Watson, where we understood the biochemistry behind it. and you got what is known as the tree of life. That is, as far as I know, the first drawing of the tree of life that was done by Darwin himself. <coughs> he only made it, did it once. But you get the, I think, the picture. Um, genetics led to the idea of the molecular clock because not only things change gradually, but they change at a more or less constant rate. And uh, the molecular clock suggested that you had this gradual change. You wait long enough and everything changes. Now, of course, what do you do with sharks that stay the same over 500 million years? I don't know. But <coughs> the, uh, this picture got complicated in 1951 when a uh, 
person by the name of Victor Freeman uh, wrote a paper uh, n noting that bacteriophage, inf that's a virus that attacks bacteria, uh, infected strains of Carinobacterium diphtheriae could produce diphtheria when other uh, bacteria that didn't have the virus did not produce the disease. So the disease is really a bacteria or a virus infected bacteria that gets to you. And of course this is relevant because in the old days people used to die of diphtheria and if you leave them alone they still can. That paper by the way is on the uh, on the internet and so now we have a whole new phenomenon that is to say these bacteria didn't get the virulence gene from their parents. Nor did they make it up themselves. So they got it from somewhere else that had the information. Um, this has led to finding natural mechanisms for what is known as horizontal gene transfer sometimes also known as lateral gene transfer, and you'll find it referred to in both ways. Um, and uh, one of them is that uh, certain E. coli bacteria have pili on them. And the idea is the pilus uh, attaches to another bacterium. The bacteria are drawn together, and then a small opening is created, allowing the genes to pass from one bacterium to another, and this is actually clinically relevant because this is how most of our resistance to such things as penicillin gets spread from bacteria to bacteria. That on that ring is not only various other genes, but it's also a gene for um, making penicillinase, which is a, a, a complex protein molecule that when it uh, is presented with penicillin breaks apart the ring and uh, makes penicillin ineffective. And uh, because of this kind of mechanism why uh, penicillinase is very common among various bacteria. And it doesn't just go from E. coli to E. coli. It can go from E. coli to salmonella for example. So now you have salmonella which is pathological which now is resistant to penicillin that it didn't used to be. Then a little more work and we found out that uh, the genes look like they are related in other ways that don't exactly match what we would normally think of as a tree. And in fact there's an article in 2000 by Ford Doolittle called Uprooting the Tree of Life, published in Scientific American. Now that one is available on the internet, but for a price. <coughs> I think it's probably available in the library. I didn't really chase it down. Um, um, but I'll quote some of the paragraphs that are supposed to be from it. Um, source is Wikipedia, so uh, they're probably not biased in favor of creationism. Um, if there had never been any lateral gene transfer, all these individual gene trees would have the same topology, the same branching order, and the ancestral genes at the root of each tree would have all been present in the last universal common ancestor, a single ancient cell. But extensive transfer means that neither is the case. Gene trees will differ although many will have regions of similar topology, and there would never have been a single cell that could, have, could be called the last universal common ancestor. What you're looking at is more of a web than a tree. Um, and I want you to notice this. Gene trees will differ. So if you have people that are telling you that you take any protein and they'll give you the same answer as to who's related to who, they're wrong. Mechanisms 
of this happening include transformation, that is direct gene transfer from one organism to the next, transduction, which is what the Carinobacterium did. It's uh, uh, viruses injecting their DNA or RNA, as the case may be, into a, a uh, uh, bacterium or perhaps something else. And uh, we're actually using transductions for uh, modifying plant proteins and sometimes in trying to cure human diseases. Bacterial conjugation, which we've seen already. And there are certain bacteria that naturally transfer genes, gene transfer agents. And um, we don't know exactly how they do it, but uh, they apparently have some enzymes that are capable of going in, snipping out, uh, snipping DNA and allowing insertion of other DNA in its place or on top of it. Now, this is again from Wikipedia, notoriously creationist bias. Uh, genetic engineering is essentially horizontal gene transfer, albeit with synthetic expression cassettes. So when you hear horizontal gene transfer, remember, it's very difficult to tell the difference between horizontal gene transfer that happens naturally and horizontal gene transfer that happens because of intelligent agents that want it transferred. <coughs> uh, to quote Doolittle in Scientific American again, only in later multicellular eukaryotes do we know of definite restrictions on horizontal gene exchange, such as the advent of separated and protected germ cells. That is to say, our inheritance is dependent on cells that uh, in ladies that are in, the, are in the ovary and men are in the testes um, that are protected from the rest of the environment and it's hard to get horizontal gene transfer in humans or other animals for that matter. Well, that's what everybody said until we have a new article which is detailing apparent significant horizontal gene trans, uh, transfer in the animal kingdom. And um, the, I was alerted to this by um, uh, Casey Luskin who wrote a big problem for common descent, hundreds of active foreign genes don't fit the standard evolutionary phylo uh, phylogeny. And um, there's a, it can be found on the web for free. There's a summary of the article which we'll look at in Science Daily, some genes foreign in origin and not from our ancestors. That is also available on the web. And um, the article itself, which we'll spend some time with, is expression of multiple horizontally acquired genes is a hallmark of both vertebrate and invertebrate genomes in genome biology, which, uh, courtesy of the US government, is now available on the web for free as well. Now, from the Science Daily article, I'm going to skip the first couple of paragraphs and read you the stuff that I think is interesting. Horizontal gene transfer is thought to play an important role in evolution of some animals, including nematode worms, which have required genes from microorganisms and plants, and some beetles that gain bacterial genes to produce enzymes for digesting coffee berries. However, the idea that horizontal gene transfer occurs in more complex animals, such as humans, rather than them solely gaining genes directly from ancestors, our parents, has been widely debated and contested. I wonder why we would refuse to recognize this. Well, lead author Alastair Crisp from the University of Cambridge, U UK said, this is the first study to show how widely horizontal gene transfer occurs in animals, including humans, giving rise to tens or hundreds of active foreign genes. Surprisingly, far from being a rare occurrence, it appears that HGT has contributed to the evolution of many perhaps all animals, and that the process is ongoing, meaning that we may need to reevaluate how we think about evolution. You're picking up genes from your food, from bacteria around you. I wonder how many Neisseria gonorrhea genes have crept into our genome. Um, the researchers studied the genomes of 12 species of Drosophila or fruit fly. 
four species of nematode worms, and ten species of primates, including humans. Now, if you're wondering why they picked those, it's because the nematode worms, uh, specifically uh, C. elegans, has been studied very, very extensively, and some of its relatives have now been studied. And the same way with Drosophila, the fruit fly, which has been studied extensively. So they're basically, they're looking for stuff under the lamppost where the light is the greatest. And of course, primates have been uh, studied extensively. And now that kind of stuff is on the internet, so you can just pull it up. You don't even have to do your own research on it. Um, they calculated how well each of their genes aligns to similar genes in other species to estimate how likely they were to be foreign in origin. By comparing with other groups of species, they were able to estimate how long ago the genes were likely to have been acquired. A number of genes, including the ABO blood group gene, were confirmed as having been acquired by vertebrates through HCGT. The majority of the other genes were related to enzymes involved in metabolism. In humans, they confirmed 17 previously reported genes acquired from HGT and identified 128 additional foreign genes in the human genome that have not previously been reported. Now, to give you some perspective, keep in mind that humans have approximately 20,000 uh, protein coding genes. So you're looking at a little over a half of 1% of the human genome came from all kinds of places, and we're going to find out some of them. Some of those genes were involved in lipid metabolism, including the breakdown of fatty acids and the formation of glycolipids. Others were involved in immune responses, including the inflammatory response, immune cell signaling, and, the, and antimicrobial responses, while further gene categories included amino acid metabolism, protein modification, and antioxidant activities. Quite a varied group. The teams were able to identify the likely classes of organisms and transfer genes came from. Uh, bacteria and protists, another class of microorganisms, were the most common donors in all species studied. They also identified HGT from viruses, which is responsible for up to 50 more foreign genomes, genes in, in primates. Some genes were identified as having originated from fungi. This explains why some previous studies, which only focused on bacteria as a source of HGT, originally rejected the idea that these genes were foreign in origin. We'll go into a little more detail with that later. The majority of HGT in primates was found to be ancient, occurring sometime between the common ancestor of chordata and the common ancestor of the primates. In other words, you couldn't find it in all chordates, but you could find it in primates. And we could be more specific if you were looking for it in other mammals. Uh, the mouse gene is another one that has been extensively studied. The authors say that their analysis probably underestimates the true extent of HGT. In other words, it's worse than what you thought. Well, at least a, a greater extent. And that direct HGT between complex multicellular organisms is also plausible. We could be doing this with giraffes and already known in some host parasite relationships. The study also has potential impacts on genome sequencing more generally. Genome projects frequently remove bacterial sequences from results on the assumption that they are contamination. While screening for contamination is necessary, the potential for bacterial sequences being a general part of an animal's genome, originally from HGT, should not be ignored. And uh, now we'll go to the, the original paper that um, made those comments uh, seem plausible to the writer at, at Science Daily. Again, we'll, we'll look at the, um, the uh, abstract here first. Background, a fundamental concept in biology is that heritable material, DNA, is passed from parent to offspring. <laughs> A process called vertical gene transfer. An alternative mechanism of gene acquisition is through horizontal gene transfer, which involves movement of genetic material between different species. 
HGT is well known in single-celled organisms such as bacteria, but its existence in higher organisms, including animals, is less well established and is controversial in humans. They didn't do that to us, did they? Um, results, we have taken advantage of the recent availability of sufficient number of high-quality genomes and associated transcriptomes to carry out a detailed examination of HGT in 26 animal species, 10 primates, 12 fruit, 12 flies, they're fruit flies, and four nematodes, and a simplified analysis in a further 14 vertebrates. Genome-wide comparative and phylogenetic analyses show that HGT in animals typically gives rise to tens or hundreds of active foreign genes, largely con concerned with metabolism. Our analysis suggests that while fruit flies and nematodes have continued to acquire foreign genes throughout their evolution, humans and other primates have gained relatively few since their common ancestor. We also resolved the controversy surrounding the previous evidence of HGT in humans and provide at least 32, 33 new examples of horizontally acquired genes. Conclusions, we argue that HGT has occurred and continues to occur on a previously unsuspected scale in metazoans and is likely to have contributed to biochemical diversification during animal evolution. Now, if you're a creationist reading this, keep in mind that HGT is indistinguishable from assisted HGT in terms of what it actually looks like. Background. The acquisition of genes from an organism other than a direct ancestor, that is horizontal gene transfer, also called lateral gene transfer, is well known in bacteria and in unicellular eukaryotes where it plays an important role in evolution, with recent estimates suggesting that on average 81% of prokaryotic genes have been involved, involved in HGT at some point. So if you want to have some idea of how much of a web the original uh, tree of life had on, it, on its trunk, 81% horizontal transfer is the current estimate. It's massive in the uh, bacterial population. However, relatively for you, Few cases have been documented in multicellular organisms. Report of HGT in animals are usually limited to the description of the transfer of only one or a few genes, making the extent of horizontal gene transfer in animals unclear. Examples include the transfer of fungal genes for carotenoid biosynthesis to the P. aphid, which results in a reg pigmentation and is thought to be beneficial to the aphid, and transfer of a cysteine synthase from a bacterium into the arthropod lineage, likely two independent transfers into a phyto, phy, phytophagus mite ancestor and a lepidopteran ancestor. So it's apparently is found in butterflies and in mites. That happened twice. Which allows the detoxification of cyanide produced by host plants. This activity is also found in nematodes where it may have been acquired by HGT from plants. Other examples of putatively adaptive HGT have been characterized in the plant parasitic nematodes, which produce cell wall degrading enzymes from a number of horizontally transferred genes. And the coffee barrier borer beetle, where a mananase has been transferred from bacteria allowing the hydrolyzation of coffee berry galactomannan. Now keep in mind that they are hypothesizing that it got transferred. Why did it get transferred? Because it's so similar to the genes somewhere else. They haven't actually seen these transfers. These transfers happen back in evolutionary history where nobody can actually see them. In exceptional cases, high levels of HGT in animals have been reported, but this has been attributed to the lifestyles of the recipient organisms. For example, in deloid uh, rotifers, which are desiccation-tolerant asexuals, the little creature sort of looks like a jellyfish, um, but actually has, a, um, uh, has an anus to it, or a cloaca, um, where it dumps its waste. Um, 
up to approximately 10% of transcripts derived from horizontally acquired genes. Desiccation results in both DNA breakage and loss of membrane integrity, both of which may potentiate HGT. In other words, their cell walls aren't as good at keeping other stuff out. A another unusual example is a transfer of the entire genome, greater than one megabyte, uh, uh, mega base, of the bacterium Wolbachia into the fruit fly Drosophila ananase, although relatively few Wolbachia genes are transcribed in this case, but the entire genome got stuck into, into the fruit fly. And that, this is one, by the way, that had been thrown away because obviously this is bacterial contamination, only it wasn't. Somehow, well, it was bacterial contamination, but it was, but it was contamination before the fact, not after. The problem, the availability of a limited number of M eukaryotic genomes for comparison studies in HGT, that was with previous papers, has lessened in the intervening decade since the first paper came out. Thousands of proteomes, including several primates, are now available in Uniprot, allowing prediction of HGT using alignment to hundreds of species and subsequent phylogenetic validation, as shown in recent work in invertebrates. And he gives some examples. In the human, however, there has been no follow-up study since the original genome paper, and the true scale of HGT in humans and metazones generally remains unclear. So they're going to do their study with now more information. To remedy this, the situation we just read about, we initially identified non-metazone to metazone HGT in multiple Drosophila, um, Canohabditis, you, you know, you're right, you're right, it's a Canohabditis, and uh, uh, I copied and pasted it straight out of the article, so they missed it. Uh, and primate, including human species. Due to the controversy uh, surrounding the human studies, we then took out our analysis uh, a step further by comparing multiple closely related species and combining information on horizontally transferred or foreign genes found in more than one species in the group, thereby reducing misidentification of HGT caused by spurious alignments. In this way, we identified up to hundreds of active foreign genes in animals, including, including humans, suggesting that HGT provides important contribution to metazoan evolution. And the results, Drosophila species, Canorabditis, there they have it right, species and primates have up to hundreds of active foreign genes. Uh, for those of you not really familiar, this is the fruit flies, this is the uh, nematode worms. To determine the scale of HGT across characterized taxonomic groups, we examined 12 Drosophila species, 4 Canorabditis species, and 10 primates, uh, for which high quality genomes and transcriptomes are available. And I'm going to skip on down. Um, I've been the first little bit was together, but after that, um, skipping around, if you want to read the whole thing, the paper, as I said, is available on the internet for free. And uh, now this is my own summary here. Uh, class C, HGT score is greater than 30. And HGT score basically is a score that suggests that there's been horizontal gene transfer. Um, and it's done by by taking the bit score of, of matching for um, other animals in the same general group versus a bit score of matching for bacteria. And all of these have greater than 30, that is they match the bacteria or they match the fungi or whatever they're, uh, this, this is supposed to be transferred from, better than they match their own evolutionary relatives, which kind of makes sense. Um, and the bit score of the 
uh, of the other organism has to be greater than 100. So it has to be a pretty good match for whatever it is out there. Class B is the average of several organisms has, a, has an H that's greater than 30. That means that you have, let's say, humans and chimps or perhaps two different species of nematode worms. Um, or perhaps four species of nematode worms that all have the same uh, gene and it all matches the bacteria better than it does insects or whatever that are supposed to be more closely related. Uh, and finally, class A says the bit score for other metazoans, other animals, um, is less than 100. So that says that it can't match very well. In other words, it isn't a super match for bacteria and a really pretty good match for other uh, animals. It just is a lousy match for other animals. And when you get all three of them, they, they're very confident that those, in fact, are horizontally transferred genes. And with that little background, you can understand this next paragraph a little bit better. We found that Canarabditis species have, on average, 173, 127, and 68 genes in HGT classes C, B, and A. By the way, everything that's in A has to be in B. Everything that's in B has to also be in C. So they're progressively more tight constrictions, or tight uh, specifications. Um, in contrast, Drosophila species have fewer active foreign genes with, on average, 40 genes in class C, 25 in class B, and only four in class A. That's Drosophila. Primate HGT levels fall between those of the invertebrate taxas with an average of 109, 79, and 32 genes per species in classes C, B, and A, respectively. And of course, that includes us. An alternative hypothesis to explain our data is that the genes we label as foreign in any single species are actually the result of conventional vertical descent but have been lost in all other animal lineages, which is a little hard to believe. Basically, the gene was preserved in the bacteria. It was preserved in the line that went to humans, but not in the line that went to mice or rabbits or anything else. Therefore, while we cannot entirely discount the gene loss hypothesis, they give the reasons for it, they're not believing it, it seems an unlikely explanation for the tens of hundreds of foreign genes per genome that we observed. Pardon me, tens or hundreds of foreign genes. Identification of new foreign genes and confirmation of previously reported examples. The first report of the human genome sequence highlighted 223 protein sequences, of which 113 were confirmed as present in the genome by PCR, that were proposed to originate from bacteria by horizontal gene transfer. While some of these genes were later confirmed as foreign, many were rejected, and they give papers that give reasons for rejection. At the time of writing, it is difficult to assess all of these sequences because some of the early identifiers have not been maintained. We're not sure exactly which sequences they were. But we have been able to confirm or reclaim 17 previously reported examples as foreign. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. What that means is that science does not pro progress unidirectionally, that sometimes there are zigs and zags, and we come back to the old position after all later on. That is to say, people who say, well, you know, creationists or anybody else in the, in the, uh, science has progressed beyond that and we're not going back. Um, it's not always true in science. Uh, some also are confirmed by other studies. Furthermore, we identified up to 128 additional foreign genes in the human genome. 128, so they're identifying new ones. 128 class C, 93 class B, 33 class A, giving a total of 145 class C genes, of which 110 
are class B and 39 are class A. So that's 145 genes in the human genome. Among these examples, we reclaim those encoding the hyaluron and synthesis, synthesis. These were originally proposed as examples of prokaryote to metazone horizontal gene transfer, as paper cited, but later rejected. However, neither study considered foreign taxa other than bacteria. We were able to identify all three hyaluron and synthesis as class A HGT originated from fungi, an assessment supported by our phylogenetic analysis. So we're getting not only genes from bacteria, but we're getting some genes from fungi, if you accept what these people are writing. The HAS genes appeared, hyaluronic um, genes appear in a wide variety of chordates, but not in non-chordate metazoans, suggesting that they result from the transfer of a single gene around the time of the common ancestor of chordata before undergoing duplications to produce the three genes found in primates. As the original rebuttal paper only focused on recent HGT and did not look at for eukaryotic matches outside of chordata, they could not detect this ancient HGT and they, of course, also didn't look for uh, fungi as the source. We also identify cases of HGT reported more recently that have not been analyzed in detail despite the potential interesting consequences of such a finding. For example, the fat mass and obesity associated gene, which is, I think, of interest to many of us here, seems to be present only in marine algae and vertebrates. Now think about how do you transfer genes from marine algae to vertebrates? Mm, fish? Which is a highly unusual distribution. Another gene proposed to have been horizontally transferred is the ABO blood group gene, which is suggested to enhance mutualism between vertebrates and bacteria. So it's an actually useful gene to have. Sorry about all this uh, old blood people. They're just, they're not as compatible with their bacteria, I guess. Um, we identify both these genes as class A HGT with phylogenetic validation. Overall, however, only 4 to 15% of C. elegans HGT, depending on classes of fungal origin. Now, of course, that's the fungi they tested. There are other fungi that presumably one could find that might have further genes. With rather more, 52 to 72% derived from bacteria. As mentioned in background section, there is phylogenetic evidence that cysteine synthase-like genes found in nematodes, including C. elegans, may have been acquired from plants closest match is in plants. Many horizontally acquired genes code for enzyme activities. In prokaryotes, horizontally acquired genes tend to be operational, typically encoding enzymes rather than informational, that is genes involved in transcription and translation. So the standard enzymes can be transferred more easily than can uh, uh, genes that manipulate DNA or, or transcribe to RNA and so forth. It has recently been suggested that network connectivity is a more important consideration than function. But nevertheless, most identified foreign genes are concerned with metabolism. Therefore, skipping down a little further, therefore like in prokaryotes, HGT is biased towards operational genes in metazoans. Foreign gene functions. Many foreign genes, like many native genes, currently uncharacterized, or are like many native genes, currently uncharacterized. We're still exploring the human genome. Even in intensively studied model organisms, for example, the human foreign gene, NG, pardon me, NSG 
A30 is annotated family with sequence similarity 129 member B, but there's no information on its role. Where foreign genes have meaningful annotation, it is clear they code for a, ride, a wide variety of different functions across a broad range of categories, some of which may overlap. Here we describe the six most noteworthy categories from largest to smallest across C. elegans, D. melanogaster, and the human. In the human, we find the genes in five of the six categories, amino acid metabolism, two genes, macromolecule modification, 15 genes, lipid metabolism, 13 genes, antioxidant activities, five genes, and innate immune response, seven genes. The, the lipid uh, metabolism genes include genes with similar functions to the C. elegans genes, such as the breakdown of fatty acids by beta oxygenation, for example, NOL CO a, or CoA, uh, hydratase 3 hydroxyl acetyl CoA dehydrogenase, with a, an impressive number of letters uh, there, as well as a wide variety of other functions, including formation of glycolipids via chain extension. And they give an example there. Or, and transmembrane transport is requir required for lipid homeostasis. For example, ATP binding cassette subfamily G, member 5. The innate immune response genes include genes involved in the re inflammatory response. For example, immunoresponsive 1 homolog IRG1. Genes for immune cell signaling, for example, phosphatidyl inocyte inositol, 4,5-biphosphate, 3 kinase, catalytic subunit gamma, and antimicrobial genes, for example, epididymal peptidase inhibitor. The difference in age between the vertebrate and invertebrate HGT with the more recently acquired foreign genes in the invertebrates having a clearer role than the ancient foreign genes in the vertebrates, which have had longer to integrate into networks. There's something else that's e even more interesting in just a little bit. Uh, foreign genes predominantly originated from bacteria and protists. I uh, missed fixing this. Uh, when calculating H, the likely taxon of origin of a foreign gene was taken to be the taxon of the best matching protein. Beta, uh, pardon me, bacteria and protists are the most common donors in all groups, which might reflect the relative abundance of the respective donor species in the environment of the recipient organisms. Or it might reflect uh, some design considerations. Foreign genes are as likely to contain introns as native genes. Now, this is where I found it fascinating. The many foreign genes that originate from bacteria would originally have lacked introns because bacteria don't have introns, but may have gained them while becoming adapted to the recipient species. Domestication. Um, think about this. So we pulled bacterial genes in, and then we put introns in so that it would fit better into our system. How do you do that without somebody designing that we need an intron here and an intron there? I'm unaware of an intron uh, inserting gene. To test this, we looked at whether bacterial origin foreign genes have introns. The Drosophila species generally have too few foreign genes to perform the analysis, but in three uh, Canarabditis species, all except for C. japonica, and all primates, the percentage of bacterial foreign genes with introns is around 95%. Somebody's been really busy inserting introns. We not only got the genes from Algeria or bacteria or wherever, we put our own introns in. Horizontal it, gene transfer is both ancient and ongoing. To determine the, whether the detected HGT is ancient prior to the emergence of the study taxon or has occurred throughout the evolution of a particular taxon, we mapped the foreign ortholog groups 
representing founding HGT events for each taxon onto the corresponding phylogenetic trees. In Drosophila species, there's a broad correspondence between the length of branch, that is time, and the number of HGT elements, uh, pardon me, events along each branch, suggesting that HGT has occurred throughout the Drosophila evolution and is likely to be ongoing. Drosophila is still picking up bacterial genes and sticking them into their genome. The distribution of transfer events is different in the primates with most of the foreign groups mapping to the base of the tree, common ancestor of primates. That is, orangutans, people, sometimes monkeys as well. I think a uh, mouse lemur, in fact, um, all have the same gene. Suggesting that the majority of HGT in primates is ancient. In these cases, we're not inferring that the HGT event occurred in the most recent common ancestor of all primates, but that it occurred sometime between the common ancestor of chordata, because it's not found in all chordates, and the common ancestor of the primates, that is, prior to the time period shown in figure one, um, which I'm not showing at this point. HGT is a general feature of chordate genomes. Because there's limited information on HGT in the chordates, we also identified foreign genes for 14 other vertebrate species. We found 60 of the uh, to 240 class C genes, approximately 0.4 to 1.3%, across all of these species in line with our finding for Drosophila, Canarabditis, and primates, suggesting that HGT is not restricted to a few animal groups. We did not try to identify class A and B genes, as our method does not produce reliable ortholog groups for species separated by large evolutionary distances. In discussion, and I'm going to skip down a ways, although phylogenetic val validation is seen as the gold standard for HGT discovery, it is important to note that many class A foreign genes have no metazoan alignments, bit scores less than 50. So need not be, indeed cannot be, validated as HGT in this way. Phylogenetic analysis won't uh, allow us to validate this. In these cases, the lack of matches with metazoan genes together with clear matches to non-metazoan sequences is sufficient to demonstrate HGT, while phylogenetics can be used to suggest the origin of such sequences. And our analysis probably underestimates the true extent of HGT in animals for several reasons. And they give two uh, good ones, and I'm going to skip down to the third one, because I think it's one of the more interesting ones. Third, eukaryotic genome projects routinely remove bacterial sequences from their assemblies on the assumption that they are contamination. This is very sensitive work, and if you get a little bacteria in, you can, uh, you can think that you're getting human or chimpanzee or uh, nematode DNA when you're actually getting bacterial DNA. For instance, this has resulted in the removal of all previously ported HGT from the DNSA genome, as Drosophila, of course. As, as a result, we may have missed further examples of bacterial HGT in our study, and such screening may explain the lower levels of HGT seen in the Drosophila species. While some screening for contamination is clearly necessary, the potential for apparently bacterial sequences to or originate from HGT should not be ignored during genome assembly. This observation emphasizes the importance of using high quality genome assemblies, as we did here when searching for HGT. So what, that, what they're saying is that people have gone through and said that just can't be and taken it out when, at least in one case, it really was. Conclusions. Although observed rates of acquisition of horizontally transferred genes in eukaryotes are generally lower than prokaryotes, it appears that, far from being a rare occurrence, HGT has contributed to the evolution of many, perhaps all, animals, and the process is ongoing in most lineages. Between tens and hundreds of foreign genes are expressed in all the animals we surveyed, including humans. The majority of these genes are concerned with metabolism, suggesting that HGT contributes to biochemical diversification during animal evolution. So we now have a new way of getting genes into people. 
and to various animals. Now, when we're looking at questions like this, I think we have to be constantly making the distinction between data and interpretation. Even some data has been removed by interpretation. So you really have to be careful about what you take as known facts. That, that is to say, it's, it's happened that uh, the DNA matches bacteria, so they looked at it and said, no, that can't be right, and just taking it out. Theory influences what data you're going to believe. We are generally, I think, obliged to accept data, although we have to be careful about data that's been massaged. We are not required to f accept flawed interpretations. And most people in science would omit that. What is being observed most of the time is not actually horizontal gene transfer. Although that can be observed experimentally, it does happen pili in uh, transferring um, plasmids from one bacterium to another is an, an example that we know happens all the time and can be seen in the laboratory. But what you're actually seeing when these people make this kind of a paper is this gene looks a lot like one over in um, this bacterium. Now sometimes I think they're right. For example, inserting the entire Wolbachia bacterium genome into uh, a particular fruit fly probably actually happened. But what is actually being observed is not that. What is being observed is gene matches between one group of animals, for example primates, and another group of organisms, for example fungi, that do not match other animals. For example, fruit flies, flatworms, fish, mice, whatever. What we are really seeing is failure of standard evolutionary theory with its vertical inheritance to explain the data and somebody trying to explain it on the basis of horizontal transfer. Remember, horizontal gene transfer is indistinguishable from designed reuse of a template, with the possible exception that design could easily explain the insertion of introns where they are appropriate, whereas horizontal gene transfer has some difficulty with that. After looking at the data, some arguments that have been used against creationism need to be abandoned. Number one, the argument that all genetic data point to the same tree of life. Obviously, in this case, they don't. And that's the difficulty. It looks like if you were to take certain enzymes, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to fruit flies. That makes no sense. Uh, um, in fact, in some cases, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to other primates. The argument that an intelligent designer would have used the same parts over and over again in different organisms, and since this hasn't occurred, the intelligent designer must not exist. And I've seen that argument used. But think about it, what it's, the problem with that argument is that the designer has used the same part over and over. He used it in algae and he used it in humans. So that, if you want to think of it in that sense, this is actually an argument for a common designer rather than common inheritance. And horizontal gene transfer is just a patch. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Instance that have been demonstrated that a gene has been transferred from a bacterium to a metazoan without intentional uh, engineering. Well, I think that the getting the entire Wolbachium 
um, genome into a fruit fly probably comes pretty close. Um, the fruit fly in question is only one of several different species that from a creation standpoint probably it all came from the same original species. Well, would this be about my help from a virus or how, how are you going to postulate this happening? So, I, you know, there's probably that entire genome got into the fruit fly somehow. Uh, Wolbachia does ha tend to infect mm -hmm. various organisms, including, as I understand it, fruit flies. So it's not that it's not that unrealistic to imagine that it could happen. Um, the interesting thing is, it is the entire genome. It is not a gene for this and a gene for that and a gene for something else that happens to be useful. That smacks of assisted gene transfer. So it probably can happen. It probably has happened, probably has happened extremely rarely. And mm -hmm. most of what you see here is just common design. But of course, their worldview won't allow for that. And so the only thing that they can say is, well, it must have come from the uh, fun fungi because it matches fungi perfectly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead and then uh, Wes. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the um, the argument of uh, evolution by analogy is uh, rampant here and uh, does not hold up. It's uh, I mean it, this is a an interesting paper we might say, but it's it's a house built on sand uh, with li little actual. Uh, uh, data you know, to support the basic assumption. The, the basic assumption is, hey, this occurs, and uh, since we found some more closely related to others and so on, it, it adds a, a nice picture, uh, but it doesn't hit at the basic question, uh, did this occur by, her, uh, by transfer, or was it uh, designed that way? And I'm reminded of a student way back in 1950 at the University of Michigan, when a professor was discussing evolution. <laughs> uh, and uh, he raised his hand and said, simply to them, he says, well, you find a muscle in man at a certain place, and you, you call it a biceps, and you find in a cat the same muscle, and you call it the biceps, and then you call it evolution. Uh, the, the terminology uh, implies at times much more than has been demonstrated. And uh, this is, uh, it goes on all the time. We, we, we do it uh, in all kinds of ways in our terminology and uh, confuses it. We need to always dig a little deeper. Uh, I agree with you. I, I, as, I, as I understand it, this is like finding a, an enzyme in humans and finding an enzyme in monkeys and saying it must have come from the same source. But the problem is, is let's suppose you find it in humans and monkeys, but you don't find it in rats, you don't find it in mice, you don't find it in rabbits, and you find it in fungi. Well, it obviously must have gotten through to the first primate ancestor. Uh, yeah, uh, gene teleportation, there we are. Um, is that Gene Roddenberry or somebody? Um, <laughs> yes. This is almost a parallel universe. Have you folks heard of, or do you remember, the old timers anyway? Lewis Thomas, no relation to Larry Thomas, who was dean of the medical school at Yale and a very name. frequent essayist at the New England Journal, wrote uh, charming little essays. 
And one of his little books, small books, actually won the National Book Award for Science, entitled Lives of a Cell. He had a reputation of being extremely witty, which I guess would have to hold as a euphemism for we don't know whether he's being serious or satirical or trying to give us information on a higher level, therefore a funny level or not. But his main contribution to the science in question today was not the horizontal transfer, uh, the uh, transference of genes, but whole organelles. In a very poetic, amusing language for which he was awarded, he would describe the implantation, which seems to be a better word than merely transfer, of primitive spirochetes. This must have happened somewhere in the primordial swamp into otherwise undifferentiated and uh, innocent cells. And these became the cilia, still upright, perfectly in sync. And that's why we have cilia in our bronchi, is because at one point in the swamp, spirochetes impregnated or implanted, implanted into these prim And that isn't the only thing. Chloroblasts, ancient primitive prokaryocytes were implanted into the cell, capital letters, and became mitochondria. And that's why we have energy in our cell, production in our cells. Mm -hmm. But you must remember that this man was highly awarded, and he wasn't just being Saturday Night Live. Uh, and it's interesting reading, The Lives of a Cell, and several other comparable books of his. I think someone has a much so more we have a comment here and thing another to say than I do. Comment here. Um, okay. Warren. Yeah, a couple questions. I'm not a geneticist, nor am I informed in genetics. So I just have questions, no comments. Um, Nowadays, a lot has been done with genetically modified uh, organisms and uh, at almost all levels, you can probably take a uh, tomato and find a, a gene from a nematode or something and insert it in a t tomato. So it can d be done artificially. What is there in the natural world that would prevent this from happening? Is there any physical basis or theoretical or even theological basis why it could not have happened? Well, certainly um, from the standpoint of Adventist theology, I don't think there's any particular theological basis why it could not have happened. Uh, in fact, there's some uh, slight indication that it might have happened as part of uh, designed uh, uh, variation. Uh, speaking about the uh, amalgamation of man and beast, this seems to come as close as anything to that particular uh, way of phrasing things. Uh, it's It's unlikely, exactly how unlikely it is is not clear for this to happen naturally. It's not only likely, but it's demonstrated that it's happened unnaturally. We now have yeast that put out insulin mm -hmm. and uh, uh, tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, and there may even be somebody in this room here who is alive today because of one of those two. Um, there are uh, uh, there is modified tissue plasminogen activator. In other words, we've 
gotten to the place where we not only get to put in the natural gene, but we can put in genes that are designed to work particularly our way. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that those genes that are put in that way are generally put in for a purpose and therefore uh, you can find a purpose and the purpose does not always have to do with the organism itself. In other words, gene, uh, yeast that have insulin genes don't grow any better than yeast that don't. Um, except that we grow them more because we like them because we get the insulin off of them. Um, there is another example. Uh, people have tried breeding roses to make a truly blue rose right. and have never been able to do that, but recently somebody inserted a blue pigment gene from another organism into the rose and apparently had to do one other little tweak to make it produce better. Mm -hmm. And we now have actual blue roses. Mm. Um, and it would be interesting, let's supposing that, you know, the, the earth were to be destroyed except for a small island where a garden of these things thrived alongside of ordinary roses. And if you did the gen genetic analysis, what would you say happened to it? And you, would you say it happened naturally? I, I raised those questions to a reasonably well-known evolutionist once and never got a reply. I think because when you start thinking of it that way, you realize that you can't really tell the difference between gene, a horizontal gene transfer and assisted horizontal gene transfer. Right. My second question, um, and it has to, has to do with uh, the presentation here and what I was seeing, a repeated phrase, that most of the examples affect metabolism, if I understood correctly. Why, why was just that one function affected? Was there a breakdown in the back door? There was a weakness or something that's across the board, why just metabolism when there are so many other functions regulated by genetics, as you know? Is, is uh, there something that you've read that would explain that? Uh, I haven't seen a good explanation. Uh, the one that occurs to me as I'm thinking about it is that if you have an extra kind of brick to build things, it can be used whenever it needs to be. If you mess with the original floor plan as to when to use those bricks, the chances of being able to, to get something that, that works well inside by just simply inserting genes elsewhere is pretty low. That is to say, those parts of the plan are more rigid than the actual, right. uh, I mean, you can use, for example, a mouse cytochrome C inside of, uh, 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 or a human cytochrome C inside of a mouse, and the mouse will grow up apparently just fine. If you start taking human genes of certain other varieties and putting them in, the mouse is going to come out very, very strange indeed. True. And I think that's why, uh, that's why metabolism is so much easier to mess with than, than than the, uh, than the regulatory stuff. You do the regulatory stuff, you do the, you know, we're going to be studying next week Fox Pro 2, and uh, the, uh, you know, it's basically, it's a DNA uh, binding gene. Well, you don't mess with those. If you do, they do very strange things and probably are not compatible with mice that actually function. They're probably also not compatible with humans that actually function. Fortunately, we haven't had too many people experimenting on that particular uh, uh, problem. Yes? Well, I, <clears throat> I don't have the background that most of you have here about this type of thing. And 
I was wondering why, <coughs> why uh, you said you find a certain gene in one species, but you don't find it in the other. And what would happen if those were reversed? You took one out of one, if you could reverse them, that is. Uh, take one out, see what happens uh, to the species if it's taken out. Uh, it depends on the uh, it depends on the species. Uh, sometimes you'll notice a difference. Sometimes you'll have a defect. Of course, if you were to reverse all of the genes, you would simply have reversal of the species. Yeah. That. Um, yeah. But uh, what happens if you do half of the genes? I don't know. Uh, three quarters of the genes. Yeah, I'm. I'm just suggesting it be an interesting question. It, it is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, uh, those kinds of questions have been raised. What happens if you have half human and half chimpanzee genes? And apparently, there were some people who tried that, got it partway through embryogenesis, and decided that they didn't want to face the difficult, the uh, ethical difficulties of what would come out, and so aborted the creature, whatever it was. I was wondering, um, a num number of years ago, uh, I think it's been at least 20, if not 30 years ago, when I first came here, there was a medical museum here on campus, and it had a lot of deformed, uh, uh, babies, you might say, or what should have been babies. And is that still here? I thought it would be interesting if we could go over there one day and look at that. I, when I first came here, they showed me the same set of things. Yeah. Um, it used to be part of the tour, and uh, um, I, I do remember seeing babies with two heads and stuff like that. Yeah, because I was saying, uh, mentioned this to someone uh, who I thought would know about it, and they seemed totally uh, surprised by it. Well, well, it used perhaps. to be known as the Dick and Jane Show for uh, Richard Schaefer, and I've forgotten what Jane's last yeah, name was. Yeah, I think was. Schaefer was involved. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and Richard Schaefer's still around. He, he might know where those things are. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, it was in Shire Hall. Uh, I remember seeing that. Anyway, uh, next week we're going to return to genetics again, and we're going to discuss Richard Dawkins' favorite gene. <laughs> Fox Pro 2 and Fox Pro 1 and Fox Pro 3, I think you will find it uh, fascinating. <laughs>